Hello all, very good morning. In today's class, I would like to start you regarding the valvular heart diseases. So there are different types of valvular heart diseases, nearly like eight to nine types. So we'll discuss one by one. Before going to the valvular heart disease, I want you to know what is the anatomy of the heart. So I'm not going to say you all the anatomy, just I'm going to say you what are the major parts that we are going to discuss. So we have valves in the heart. So we have atrioventricular valves and we have semilunar valves. So the valves between the atrium and ventricle, these are called as atrioventricular valves and the valves mainly that were there in the pulmonary vein and pulmonary artery, these are called as semilunar valves. So coming to the topic here, if you see, as I am discussing, we have two atrioventricular valves and we have two semilunar valves. So coming to the atrioventricular valves. So in atrioventricular valve, we have two mitral valve and we have tricuspid valve. So this tricuspid valve, it is situated in the right side of the heart. So in the right side of the heart between the ventricle and the atrium, right ventricle and right atrium. So this valve, it is called as tricuspid valve. So it has three leaflets. That's what we are saying it as tricuspid valve. Coming to the mitral valve, it is also called as bicuspid valve. So this one, it is situated in the left side of the heart. It is situated between the left atrium and left ventricle. So we are calling it as atrioventricular valve. Coming to the semilunar valve, we have aortic valve. So the, this valve is located in the arch of aorta, near the opening of the arch of aorta. And uh, pulmonary valve, it is situated in the pulmonary artery. So here this pulmonary artery, it arises from the right ventricle and it carries the deoxygenated blood mainly away from the heart towards the lung so any blood any blood which is carried away from the heart the carrying vessels they are termed as arteries and any any vessels that are carrying the blood towards the heart they are termed as veins that's what even the pulmonary blood vessel it is carrying the deoxygenated blood since it is carrying the blood away from the heart we are saying it as a pulmonary artery so that's what we are calling it as a pulmonary artery. So since it is carrying the blood away from the heart towards the lung, it is considered as pulmonary artery. Even though it is carrying the deoxygenated blood, we are determining it as a pulmonary artery. So it is very simple. Hope you are understanding any blood vessel that is carrying blood towards the heart. It is termed as a vein. Nextly, any blood vessel that is carrying out blood away from the heart, it is termed as a artery since the blood vessel which is situated between the right ventricle and the lung since it is carrying the blood to away from the heart towards the lung it is considered as pulmonary artery even though it is carrying deoxygenated blood it is determined as a pulmonary artery so these are the heart valves hope you understood the topic coming to the types of valvular heart diseases so we have different types so based on this stenosis based on the regurgitation and based on the prolapse we are considering it stenosis means nothing but constriction or narrowing of the heart valve regurgitation means nothing but due to the incomplete closure due to the incomplete closure the leaflets they are not closing enough so you can see here this is a normally closed valve and you can see here this is the stenotic valve and you can see it is not closing normally so when it is not closing normally, automatically the regurgitation is occurring means nothing but the backflow of the blood it is there. So that's what we are calling it as regurgitation means nothing but incomplete closure of the valve leaflets which are mainly resulting in the backward flow of the blood. So these are considered as regurgitation. So we'll see based on the valve in which is based on the valve in which is involved, we are determining the disease name. So if it is the mitral valve involved, we are calling it as mitral valve stenosis. If there is regurgitation that is occurring, we will call it as mitral valve regurgitation. If it is prolapsed, we will call it as mitral valve prolapse. If it is pulmonary valve, we will call it as pulmonary stenosis or we will call it as pulmonary regurgitation. So we will discuss one by one. As we are discussing, these are the types of valvular heart diseases that are mainly occurring. We have mitral stenosis, narrowing of the mitral valve. We have mitral regurgitation. So due to the incomplete closure of the leaflets that are there in the mitral valve, it is resulting in the regurgitation means nothing but there is backward flow of the blood. And nextly, we have mitral prolapse. So this one is also the same way here what is happening means the mitral wall instead of staying in its position it is protruding out which is resulting in the leakage of blood. So this is called as mitral prolapse and we have aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, tricuspid stenosis and we have tricuspid regurgitation, pulmonary stenosis and pulmonary regurgitation. So in this topic today I would like to discuss you regarding the mitral stenosis. 
what is this mitral stenosis means nothing but the narrowing of the mitral valve so the stenosis means nothing but narrowing so narrowing of the mitral valve it is termed as mitral stenosis you can see here this is the normal heart these are the valves so this one it is the mitral valve and it is the tricuspid valve these are pulmonary, pulmonary valve and this is the aortic valve you can see here this is the pulmonary and this is the aortic valve so coming to the mitral valve if you see in this picture observe clearly so so if you see if you keenly observe the mitral valve here you can see here here the mitral valve is normally wide open so generally the blood is passing from left atrium to left ventricle so what it is doing it is guide it is acting as a valve so when it is wide open clearly there is no pressure being developed in the left atrium and the blood can completely empty into the left ventricle from left ventricle when the mitral valve is closing it can go into the systemic circulation through the aortic valve but when there is mitral valve stenosis you can observe here coming to the left picture right picture if you see there is stenosis here so here the pathway is exactly wide open and here the pathway is not open you can clearly observe i think so see you can see here the pathway is exactly wide open but here the pathway is closed you can see the pathway is closed since the pathway is closed the blood cannot enter the blood cannot enter from the left atrium to left ventricle why because the pathway is very low and only minimal amount of blood is allowed through the valve which will result in the left atrium which will result in the left atrium failure so the pressure in the left atrium is constantly building and ultimately here the blood is lodging the blood is lodging in the pulmonary veins the blood is lodging in the pulmonary veins and it is resulting in the lung edema so when the left atrium is not receiving the good amount of blood what will happen the remaining amount of blood which is coming from the lung it will stay inside the lung and it will cause pulmonary edema so this is one of the potential cause which can happen with this mitral wall stenosis etiology it is mainly caused due to the rheumatic heart disease so here majority of the adult cause of the mitral valve stenosis is resulting from what rheumatic heart disease or rheumatic endocarditis and some of the other conditions that are involved are congenital mitral stenosis rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus erythematosus these are very infrequent means these are very less frequent and this this is the major cause for which is resulting in the mitral valve stenosis what is this rheumatic heart disease coming to the pathophysiology so any pathophysiology if you take firstly we will have to write what are the causes so what are the causes here what is the major cause rheumatic heart disease or rheumatic endocarditis along with other causes other causes means congenital abnormalities rheumatoid arthritis systemic lupus erythematosus and some food habits and dietary habits also are also involved i am not stressing those so what will happen so due to these causes what is happening is the scarring of these leaflets as well as chordae tendineae so this chordae tendineae and are the supporting structures for this leaflets mainly in the, they are present in the heart they will help in the opening and closing of these leaflets so once the scarring is occurring if the scarring is developed then the automatically it will result in the contracture means it cannot move freely so if it is not moving freely what will have happen means there will be adhesions that are developing between the leaflet so if you see the picture here if you see the picture i'll show you in this picture if you see these are the chordae tendineae these are the chordae tendineae and these are mainly helping the valve to open and close they are the supporting structure so there is scarring occurred between these leaflets as well as the chordae tendineae what will happen it will result in the contractility if it is resulting in the contractility additions will develop once the additions are being developed what will happen as you can see in the picture clearly here if you see additions are being developed here so these are the chordae tendineae and this is the leaflet so this is the normal leaflet but due to the scarring it is being wide open so once it is being wide opened it will look like a funnel it will look like a funnel and the the blood control is not being there and uh, what is happening here even the leaflets are becoming thick here the leaflets are becoming thick even though they are thick and they are looking like funnel because 
the pathway has been narrowed the blood cannot enter into the left ventricle very easily or and it will result in the further complications because of this thickening and shortening of the structure what i said it will result in the obstruction of blood flow so obstruction of blood flow from the mitral wall so here if you see consider for just for an example i am drawing this so this is the heart this is the right side and this is the left side for example so consider this one as leaflet and this one as leaflet and these are chordae tendine so these are the supporting structures so what happened here because of the disease condition these chordae tendine and these leaflets they became fused they became fused and they are now showing us like a funnel shaped structure they are showing us like a funnel shaped structure but even though it is in the funnel shaped structure this was thickened enough and it was very short in length so this this is the thickness the funnel shape is having so the mitral valve is becoming in this way so the when the mitral valve is in this way whether the blood can enter in a normal manner no it cannot enter in a normal manner so there is obstruction of blood mainly in the mitral wall so here the pressure gradient difference between the left atrium and left ventricle develop so here the left atrium is taking more amount of pressure the pressure increase pressure in the left atrium so once the pressure has been increased in the left atrium as i said as the blood is mainly coming from the pulmonary vein it is connected to the heart so it will result in the pulmonary vasculature hypertrophy means due to the increased pressure in the pulmonary vein it will go for hypertrophy means if the size of the pulmonary vasculation means the size of the pulmonary blood vessels has been increased and the pulmonary vessel in chronic congestion so it will go into the chronic congestion situation so here you can observe the exertional dyspnea mainly due to the increase of pulmonary compliance means nothing but due to the increased pressure in the pulmonary vein the blood is lodging there the blood is coming and pooling in lungs as well as the pulmonary vasculature so what will happen the hypertension is developing here mainly it will result in the reactive pulmonary hypertension and it will also result in the right ventricular hypertrophy so here you need to understand one thing in, in order to understand the pathophysiology of this mitral wall stenosis you need to understand first what is the circulation so don't think i am taking time just try to listen for example this is the heart just for example i am drawing for example this is the heart and this is the right atrium left atrium right ventricle and left ventricle and these are the lungs which were situated above the right above the heart so this right atrium for suppose it is receiving the blood from all over the body and from right atrium through the tricuspid valve which is present over here this is the tricuspid valve it is entering into the right ventricle from right ventricle it is entering into the lungs so from right ventricle where it is entering it is entering into the lungs again from the lungs it is coming into the left atrium it is coming into the left atrium and from left atrium it is going through the mitral valve to the left ventricle from left ventricle it is again going all over the body so this is the normal circulation hope you are under, hope you are understanding so from body the deoxygenated blood is carried out into the right atrium from right atrium it is entering into the right ventricle and from right ventricle through the pulmonary artery through the pulmonary artery it is the deoxygenated blood is traveling to the lungs and after getting purified in the lungs through the pulmonary vein the oxygenated blood is entering into the left atrium and from left atrium through the mitral valve it is entering into the left ventricle and it is again going into the body so you, in order to understand this pathophysiology if you see here since the mitral valve stenosis is present here the blood is pooling in this uh, pulmonary vein so this is the pulmonary vasculature so it is pooling in the pulmonary vein as well as it is pooling in the pulmonary artery so it is disturbing the lungs it is disturbing the pulmonary artery it is disturbing the pulmonary vein so ultimately as the pressure gradient is increasing first the blood will lodge in the left atrium then the pulmonary vein then the lungs and ultimately it will again come and lodge in the pulmonary artery and it will lodge it will keep more pressure in the right ventricle which will result in the right ventricular hypertrophy and you can see the right ventricular failure here so this is the pathophysiology so when there is mitral wall stenosis is occurring 
if you know the circulation you can write simply the pathophysiology so due to the causes if there is any kind of rheumatoid endocarditis or any other causes it is mainly resulting in this scarring of the leaflets and cordate tendon these leaflets are the valves which will open and close and this cordate tendon are the supporting structures for these leaflets so when these are becoming diseased they will contract and they will become an ad adhesion so when there is adhesion means when these both leaflet and cordate tendon are attaching very tightly with contraction it will result in a funnel shaped structure even though it is a funnel shaped structure because of this stenosis what is happening because of the inflamed cordate tendon and this decreased size of the cordate tendon as well as the leaflets the pathway between the right the pathway between the left atrium is left ventricle it is being decreased and the blood cannot enter into the left ventricle so what will happen it will mainly affect the pulmonary vascularization means pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein and ultimately since the blood is mainly coming from the right ventricle to the lungs and lungs to the left uh, right at left atrium the pressure in the right ventricle increases gradually and it will result in the right ventricular failure so if the if the problem is arising in the left side of the heart if it is arising in the atrioventricular between the atrioventricular walls of left side of the heart it will result in the right ventricular hypertrophy or right ventricular failure so this is the pathophysiology of mitral wall stenosis hope you got understood i think uh, if you have if you haven't understood please let me know i'll try to explain you the path of physiology in the same way uh, coming to the other part what you, what type of clinical manifestation that you can observe means you can observe dyspnea because it is mainly affecting the lungs you can observe the orthopnea and you can observe the pnd nothing but paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea means nothing but it is mainly occurring during the night it is a severe shortness of breath which mainly occurs during the night so these are the clinical manifestations of mitral wall stenosis and if you have understood the pathophysiology you can write acute pulmonary edema so it is mainly precipitated due to the uncontrolled atrial fibrillation so because there is pressure gradation between the valves atrial walls and ventricular valves and atrium and the right atrium left atrium so here since the pressure gradient is present you can have the atrial fibrillation and this acute pulmonary edema it can be precipitated whenever you are going for exercise if there is any kind of chest infection or if there is anesthesia or during the pregnancy you can find acute pulmonary edema mainly due to the mitral wall stenosis and you can also see fatigue so this is mainly due to the decreased cardiac output so it can result whenever there is moderate or mild stenosis you can see this fatigue and also you can observe hemoptysis nothing but the blood it is mixed with sputum due to different types of reasons so these are some of the clinical manifestations and also we can have alveolar capillary rupture so you can observe nothing this alveolar this alveolar capillary rupture means nothing but there will be pink frontally pulmonary edema this is just because since the capillaries they are very thin in structure this alveolar capillary rupture it occurs mainly due to the increased pressure in the pulmonary vasculature so since the capillaries they cannot withhold lot of pressure they will rupture and it will result in the alveolar capillary rupture and also you can see bronchial vein rupture so it, when the bronchial vein rupture occurs it will result in the large hemorrhage and also you have blood stain sputum so during the bronchitis it will result in the blood stain sputum if for this mitral wall stenosis and also you can observe the hoarseness of voice this is mainly due to the left recurrent laryngeal nerve compression so this one it is called as ortner sign also you can see dysphagia because th this is mainly due to the esophageal compression and you can see the left lung collapsing you can see the left lung collapse so this is mainly due to the left main bronchus compression you see these are some of the clinical manifestations that you can see in the mitral wall stenosis coming to the investigation part we'll go for history collection and physical examination we'll do some uh, ecg chest x-ray x-ray they will go for the cardiac catheterization so mainly they will check the pcwp nothing but the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure they are checking the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and lap means nothing but left atrial pressure so mainly they are checking the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure so mainly they want to know what is the amount of pressure that is being kept in the heart because of the mitral wall stenosis and also they will check the left atrial pressure and they will also go for the echocardiogram mainly they will go the they will go for the screening of heart nothing but 2d echo
so these are the types of murmurs that you can hear in the mitral wall stenosis so here the mild murmur it is starting after the s2 and at and uh, it is ending at s1 and the uh, intensity of the murmur it it increases just before the s1 is starting the long murmur it is indicating the severe mitral wall stenosis actually if you see this os this is nothing but the opening snap we will call it as an opening snap so in mitral wall stenosis it is heard when the diastole is when the diastolic is starting so there you can hear a sound it is a very high pitched sound we are calling it as os so if these are valves are classified calcified means calcified means if they are becoming contraction if the funnel shape is being formed then you cannot hear this os if they are not calcified then you can hear this os so the long murmur it is indicating the severe mitral wall stenosis and os it cannot be heard if the valves are getting calcified coming to the management of this uh, mitral wall stenosis so here asymptomatic patients they need only infective endocarditis prophylaxis if there are mild signs and symptoms are present then we will go for the salt intake restriction and we will go for the oral stenosis means what we are doing we are not allowing the patient to take more amount of salt and if there is atrial fibrillation is present we are giving the digoxin beta blocker or we are giving the calcium channel blockers so what they will do they will control the restoration of sinus rhythm and may attempt if it is appropriate and also we are giving the anticoagulants anticoagulants we are giving for the patients who has thromboembolism for one year at least one year and if they have this uh, atrial fibrillation we are giving the anticoagulants for lifetime so this is the management in mitral wall stenosis in surgical management we are doing the closed valvectomy so what we are doing means we are separating the fused cups by using the dilator which is introduced mainly through the left ventricular apex open valvectomy mainly we are going with the cardiopulmonary bypass it is mainly preferred to closed valvotomy clubs separation under the direct vision so we are seeing that directly in the in the open way we are doing and we are separating the fused cups so any fusion of subvalvular operators we are mainly loosening this mainly in the open valvotomy and last one what we are doing is we are going for the mitral wall replacement that is also called as mvr so mitral wall replacement is only done when the valves when the re when the leaflets they are heavily calcified then we are going for this mitral wall replacement so these are the surgical management we will go for a closed valvotomy open valvotomy mitral valve stenosis so you can see in the picture here this is the closed mitral valvotomy so they will use an instrument which is called as logan tube dilator so using the tube dilator they will keep the tube dilator in a position and they will use the finger also in this surgery so what this dilator will do is it will locate the mitral wall position and it will dilate the leaflet so you can see here so here the person he is using his finger mainly to guide the mitral wall position so once he has guided the tube dilator it has been set in position and they are dilating they are dilating the closed mitral leaflets and the valve is wide open and the blood can pass through the left atrium and left ventricle so this is one of the procedure and next procedure that they are going to perform is mitral balloon valvotomy if you see this mitral balloon valvoplasty so i'll just try to explain you here so what they will do they will pass a guide where mainly through this cava so they will after passing the superior vena cava what they will do is they will do atrial transceptor puncture so you, as you can see here they have done the atrial transceptor puncture and this guide where it is passed through the mitral valve so it will enter into the left atrium from left atrium it is it has been passed into the mitral valve so you can see here in picture here they have done the and they have done the atrial transeptual puncture here and the guide wire also you can see this uh, through by guiding this guide wire they have entered into the mitral valve and from mitral valve they, the guide wire has been entered into the arch of iota so with this they will confirm that the catheter has been placed in the exact position where the mitral valve is involved they will bring the balloon catheter to the mitral valve area and they will dilate the catheter so once they dilate the catheter the leaflets which were fused they will be separated and the blood flow it can be achieved in a normal manner so this is the balloon valvoplasty so i am going to explain you in detail regarding the types of surgery that they are performing in the valvular disorders in the last topic so please follow the classes with this i would like to end this session thank you so much for watching 
please follow the further classes to know the nursing management for the valvular heart diseases so i'll explain you regarding the pulmonary regurgitation pulmonary stenosis in next class we'll see what is the next class we will see what is the mitral wall regurgitation hope you understood if you have any queries please let me know drop them in the comment box thank you so much thanks for watching please like share and subscribe the channel